What do you think of when you hear about Swaziland? Sugar monarchy, right? But could you tell me where it's located? Many will say, somewhere south of the African continent. So the fact that looking at a map we can't immediately be precise about its exact location tells us that we are looking at a very small state, if not the smallest in southern Africa and with few inhabitants. Its territory is landlocked and shares borders almost entirely with South Africa and minimally to the east with Mozambique. We can divide it into four distinct regions, locally called the Veld, Africa's four fields, the mountainous high veld in the northwest, where the two capitals Mbabane and Lobamba are located, the hilly middle veld in the center, the flat low veld in the south, and the Lubombo region in the east. The territory is crossed by many rivers and streams, which provide the country with one of the most abundant water supplies in southern Africa. Swaziland, or rather Eswatini, so named by the ruler Mzwati III in 2018 on the occasion of his birthday, isn't only part of a territory of very ancient formation geologically, but its population history is also ancient, as artifacts and human remains dating back more than 100,000 years have been found. The Swazis were part of the great migratory wave of Bantu-speaking Guni peoples who, during the 14th and 15th centuries, descended from the headwaters of the Cross River in Cameroon, through Kenya and Tanzania, to an area between the Lubombo Mountains and the Indian Ocean, near the Lagoa Bay in Mozambique. And it was in that area that in the last decades of the 16th century, Portuguese sailors shipwrecked off the coast of Mozambique came across them, claiming that the inland areas beyond the Lagoa Bay were well populated and that the brisk ivory trade was taking place along the coast. When clans broke away from the mother group, they took the name of the clan leader, and one of the first to do so was that of the Lamini, the ancestor of the present Swazi royal family. His immediate successors incorporated many of the other clans along the Lubombo mountains and began to spread south and west, eventually settling near what is now Langano, in the southwestern part of present-day Eswatini. The kingdom then experienced a major expansion, thanks to the fighting king Mzwati II, who was in office from 1839 to 1865, and who, taking advantage of the peaceful relations his father Subuza I had established with the belligerent Zulu people from South Africa, was able to extend his holdings almost undisturbed, incorporating territories such as present-day Nelsprut, Barberton, Carolina, Ermelo, Pitretif and Kuze. But then came the turn to reckon with European settlers, and I'm referring to the Boers of the Transvaal Republic, who in an attempt to free themselves from the British, and desperate for an outlet to the sea, expanded eastward, trying to wrest land from the Swazis by hook or crook. Until, with the Pretoria Convention of 1881, the Boers succeeded in forcing the then Swazi ruler Manzani to accept that at least half of the original Swazi territory would fall under Boer hands. At that point, the Lion of Swaziland, King Subuza II, in office since December 1921, was the only one who tried to reunite the people divided by those boundary decisions and cancel the country's existing land property model. It, in fact, didn't grant the Swazis any control over the economic destiny of the nation, because by granting Boer and Afrikaner concessionaires mineral deposits and land areas, it effectively stripped the country of sovereignty over those lands. So Buza II, in order to have that property model dismantled, led the delegation to London in 1922 to meet with King George V, but the British government declared that it was unwilling to reopen the issue of African land partition. Of the same opinion were the Privy Council judges, who said that the measure under which the Swaziland had been expropriated had the same status as an act of state, and as such couldn't be challenged. The only solution was to set up a public fund, the LIFA fund, to try to slowly buy back the land previously taken by Boers and Afrikaners. This necessity failed when the United Kingdom finally granted independence to Swaziland in 1968. Then, once independence was achieved and the land taken away from the concessionaires, it remained to adjust the borders with South Africa. For the sake of brevity, I won't go into detail and simply tell you that this wasn't simple and involved several authorities. Butelezi, leader of the KwaZulu-Natal province, the historical home of the Zulus, Peter Kornoff, South African Minister for Cooperation and Development, and the Organization for African Unity, which was formed in 1963 to eliminate all forms of colonialism in Africa. It all revolved around the unification of Swaziland with two strategic regions to which Sobuza II aspired, Kangwane and Ingwavuma the latter in particular guaranteeing control of the port city of Kosi Bay, and so an important outlet to the sea. 
to these borders don't correspond to those so desired by Sobuza II, because the two regions today are part of South Africa. What interests us is that the king decided to remain part of the Commonwealth and adopted a form of constitutional monarchy. Because of this, he encountered opposition from supporters of absolutism. So much so that in 1973, after a long series of clashes, he was forced to dissolve parliament and political parties, restoring the traditional regime, from there on until the ascension in 1986 of the current ruler Mzwati III, the triumph of absolutism would be overwhelming, and any popular demands about greater democratic openings would sometimes be bloodily suppressed, and sometimes silenced with promises that were never kept. Prominent among these were the tensions and unrest triggered during 2021 by the killing by security forces of student Tavani in Komonia while participating in a pro-democracy demonstration. The ruler was accused of hiring foreign mercenaries for the occasion, while the overall toll of the crackdown was 80 deaths over the course of the various riots. But when you hold absolute power, it's easy to crush dissent, especially if the people continue to remain attached to the monarchical institution and the values of unity and social peace they believe it represents. Another example of how risky it is to challenge the Crown's choices is provided by a 2014 episode, the sentencing to two years in prison of journalist Becky Makubu and human rights lawyer Tulani Maseko, who were guilty of daring to publish an article in a national newspaper questioning the administration of justice in the country, an attitude so unwelcome to the top leadership that they also charged them with contempt of court, causing them to be subjected to pre-trial detention for three months. In 2014, police stormed into my office with a warrant of arrest signed by the King's Chief Justice, working together with my government. I spent a month in pretrial detention and three months of a sham trial. When the verdict came, I was sentenced to two years in prison without the option of a fine. On the, day of the on the day of sentencing, Human Rights Watch publicly reported that the full exercise of human rights in Eswatini was in steep decline, as political parties aren't allowed and the judiciary is severely compromised, pointing the finger at the indifference of neighboring South Africa and the Southern African Development Community, of which Eswatini is a part. The same article states that the government also abused the repressive tools contained in the 2008 anti-terrorism law to target independent organizations, accusing them of being terrorist groups and crush civil society activists through abusive surveillance and illegal searches of homes and offices. And on the press freedom side, worse than ever. Broadcaster licenses aren't recognized except in rare cases, and the two main daily newspapers are related to the government elite, such as the Eswatini Observer, wholly owned by the omnipresent national investment fund Tibio Takanguane, which among other things is the major shareholder in the sugar giant Royal Eswatini Sugar Corporation. We'll return to this in a moment. Another phenomenon that has plagued the country for quite some time is not political, but health-related namely the very high incidence of HIV among the population. According to available data, more than 27% of adults are living with the disease, and in 1999, King Mzwati III officially declared the spread of the virus a national disaster. The first move was to enact the recently abolished chastity law, which imposed virginity for women until the age of 24. Efforts were also made to raise funds for prevention, care and treatment, but the resources set aside between 2013 and 2014 were no more than $33 million, less than one-third of the total figure of $100 million allocated by various international entities. And now we come to talk about Eswatini from an economic point of view. We are facing one of the poorest countries in the world, with a national GDP of $3.9 billion that places it at the bottom of the world ranking, 160th out of 197. Despite this, GDP per capita is not among the lowest of the African continent, taking into account that it has almost halved from 2012 values and that more than half of the inhabitants live below the poverty line. The rural context occupies the vast majority of the population and in fact the predominant economic activity remains agriculture, while only the large plantations of cotton, tobacco, but especially sugar cane, are managed on an entrepreneurial basis. 
Most of the national GDP, however, comes from the valuable mining activities, such as diamonds, asbestos, tin and coal, largely controlled by South Africa, while tourism is experiencing some development, attracted by parks and nature reserves. In fact, these are populated by extremely rich wildlife. And one piece of news that may not displease animal rights activists is that under the law of the realm, park rangers can shoot poachers on sight and possibly kill them without incurring any conviction or penalty. But why is Eswatini referred to as the sugar monarchy? Well, simple, because the best, closest to water sources and most fertile lands have been allocated to intensive sugarcane cultivation. In 2014, there were 400 billion liters of water used by major companies active in the sector to irrigate the thousands of hectares of plantations located mainly in the Lubombo region. First among them is the Royal Eswatini Sugar Corporation, which manages nearly 22,000 hectares and produces over 430,000 tons of sugar each year. Its shareholders are the omnipresent Tibio Takanguane Fund, set up by King Sobuza II in 1968, RCL Foods, the government of Nigeria, the government of Eswatini, and others. In second place is Ubombo Sugar Limited, 40% owned by the usual sovereign wealth fund Tibio, and 60% by the South African multinational Ilobo Sugar Limited. Its consumption of water resources is no joke either. Between 2013 and 2014, it stood at around 154 billion liters. The problem is that water is not only consumed, it's often altered, spoiled by intensive agriculture that demands much more from the land that it can provide, and by the use of pesticides and fertilizers. But there is little we can do about it. Sugar is the country's flagship. Its importance is reflected in exports, GDP and the number of people employed in agriculture. Factors, however, that haven't helped to improve living conditions in Eswatini, given that, as I mentioned, GDP per capita is just over $3,000. Sugar weighs so heavily on the economy that the Crown not only staked the land to bolster the sector, but also chose to make itself fiscally attractive to large multinational investors, mainly the Coca-Cola company. The US company's 2013 financial statements in the section on taxes show that Brazil, Costa Rica, Singapore and Swaziland are four countries that would have reserved tax incentives for it. Certainly, however, the fortunes of Coca-Cola's income statements haven't been matched by those who inhabit the country and don't own shares in the TBO fund, which still proves to be an all too sectoral development tool from which very few can benefit. Coca-Cola is also active in the country today through its subsidiary Conco, which buys sugar from local producers and processes it directly there to produce the drink concentrate. After that, according to the report Swaziland Southern Africa's Forgotten Crisis, much of the concentrate is then shipped to Coca-Cola's bottling plant in Nesprut, South Africa. The same report also states that in 2013, Coca-Cola's contribution to Swaziland's economy would have been between 20 and 40% of GDP. As early as 2012, the British newspaper The Guardian raised the issue with the titled article Coca-Cola accused of propping up notorious Swaziland dictator, and many claimed that the US giant's profits weren't helping the people of Eswatini as the king grew richer and richer. The accusation of helping to secure profits for the crown had been answered by Sherwa Shireni, Coca-Cola's Central Africa spokeswoman, by stating that King Mzwati III wasn't receiving any profits or dividends from Congo Swaziland. From Congo, maybe not, but Congo is only one part of the multinationals' branched presence in the country. On the other hand, as far as foreign trade is concerned, the largest relations are with the powerful neighbor South Africa, but 20% of exports are to the old continent, so much so that the European Union has ratified economic partnership agreements with the country, centered mainly on the tax-free export of several products, including, guess what, sugar. You are familiar with China's strategy of penetration into Africa. You know that the Asian nation is a major trading partner for many African states, but still Eswatini remains the white sheep of the flock, recognizing Taiwan's sovereignty. So, as a result of the One China policy, it renounces diplomatic and trade relations with Beijing. I remind you of my old video on tense relations between Taiwan and China. Catch it up if you missed it. Things may be changing, however. 
In fact, it seems that a Swazi crown will sooner or later want to follow in Nicaragua's footsteps and remove itself from the list of states that recognize Taiwan's sovereignty as it moves closer to the China's policies on the 5G deal. What will become of Eswatini in the near future? Widespread discontent with the crown shows that something is moving, but how many inhabitants are really willing to accept change? Could it be the close ties to tradition that prevented people from opening their eyes to the bitter reality? Well, we are done for today as well. Thank you all for your attention and see you in the next video. Ciao!